WrestleMania 29, Undertaker vs. CM Punk. I was there. I was there at the show. And to be honest, that match stole the show. What do you expect to CM Punk and The Undertaker? And it was a memorable night. Like, I, like the storyline was really uncomfortable. Like, let's start it off. On March 4th episode of Raw, which celebrated old school Raw, The Undertaker returned to WWE by opening up the show, signal signaling any challenger to face him and try to end his undefeated WrestleMania streak at the event. CM Punk, Randy Orton, Big Show, and Sheamus all declared they wanted to face The Undertaker, prompting Raw's general manager, Vic Vicky Guerrero, to set up a fatal four-way match among the four later that night. CM Punk won the match by pinning Orton, earning him a match against The Undertaker. Now, prior to this, CM Punk had been pushing that he didn't want to fight The Undertaker. He wanted to be in the main event with The Rock and Cena in a triple threat elimination match, where... CM Punk wanted to retain his title at the Royal Rumble and at Elimination Chamber, then go on to lose at WrestleMania. Then there was also rumors that they were going to do Undertaker versus CM Punk for the WWE title, Streak versus title reign, Streak versus championship, which would have been interesting, but yeah, considering what would have happened, considering Undertaker was no longer a full time wrestler, I didn't think that would happen. So. Yeah, CM Punk eventually would earn the right to fight Undertaker, and CM Punk said in an interview in, a, in the podcast with Cole Cabana um, that he did not give zero, he gave zero fucks about the whole match and the build-up, and I was thinking, like, if that was you not caring whatsoever about this match, I would like to see what it would have been like if you were invested, because the build-up was really good, albeit very uncomfortable, because after, um... That match with CM Punk and Orton, Sheamus, and Big Show when they finally had the match set for CM Punk versus Undertaker. Uh, Undertaker and Kane's former manager Paul Bearer died of respiratory problems. And the next week on Raw, during a ceremony for Paul Bearer, Undertaker and Kane were celebrating his legacy. Um, Punk interrupted the Paul Bear's tribute segment to boast that he would break the Undertaker's streak, which prompted Undertaker's brother Kane to attack Punk, although Punk escaped. And later that night, um, Kane defeated Punk in a no-DQ match before Undertaker came to the stage to perform a signature um, ritual which, with Kane to honor Punk. However, okay, like, okay, interrupting the guy's tribute, okay, fine, Th let's just do that. Uh, let's hope they don't go too far. They went, they went far, like, went far and wide. Like, it went to uncomfortable levels of the death angles. Where CM Punk grabbed the owner of the Underta Undertaker's manager, Paul Bear, and started hitting Kane in the back of his head with it. And, which prompted Undertaker to chase him away and fuming. And Punk escaped with the urn. And this would lead to... Uh, the remainder of the build to be very uncomfortable, where CM Punk was mocking and degrading the Undertaker's manager, degrading the urn that Undertaker used as, well, his property. But Punk further boasted about being the one to snap the streak while nonchalantly tossing the urn in the air, and saying that if you get counted out or disqualify, still a loss. So... Yeah, this is when things were getting really uncomfortable with the storyline. And it made me curious about what would have been the storyline had Paul Bear not died. Like, that always interested me. Like, the storyline that could have been had Paul Bear not died. If he didn't die, then what would be the storyline? That, that's something very curious. And then finally, on the final Raw before WrestleMania, I was there too. I watched it and I cringed. Um, the Undertaker declared that he would put an end to CM Punk saying he would not live to talk about breaking the streak, even if, in a, in a matter, if Punk actually broke the streak, but it looked like a real possibility, and then these druids came out, um, and Paul Heyman came out dressing up as Paul Bear, and I was like, oh god, this is so uncomfortable, where, um, he mocked Paul Bear's, and... Here's the thing I found out. Accordingly, Paul Bear's ch children said that they were all right with the whole segments. 
and they had given them their blessing, their consent to do all this storyline stuff. But it was this moment that they felt like WWE went too far. Like they were told beforehand that we're going to do this angle and whatnot, and they were said okay. But when they actually saw it, they said, "Yeah, that was probably a bad idea." So P CM Punk came out disguised as a druid, further assaulting the Undertaker on Raw and constantly beating him with the urn. And then Punk decided to boldly open the urn and empty its contents, and technically it would be Paul Bear's ashes, in storyline terms, over a fallen Undertaker. And, yeah, Undertaker is... Yeah, like, when I was hearing Undertaker was hurt and was dealing with all these nagging injuries, like, every shot that happened, I just cringed because I just didn't want to see Undertaker get hurt. And the fact that this was possibly the best storyline heading into WrestleMania 29 was probably bittersweet because at the same time, you're thinking, yeah, they really should stop. So, the first, and this was actually part of a, quote, triple main event. We were going to get CM Punk versus The Undertaker, Triple H versus Brock Lesnar, and The Rock versus John Cena, too. And, yeah, I don't get that system either. Like, WWE tries to promote it as a triple main event, yet yeah, everyone knows the main event is the match that goes on last. So, <clears throat> Punk came out with his signature entrance song, Cult of Personality, with the band Living Color playing, playing the music, which was awesome. And... At first, this match was going through psychological matters, like CM Punk was taunting The Undertaker, trying to intimidate The Undertaker, slapping The Undertaker, and Punk countered every single maneuver he could come up, The Undertaker could give him. And, yeah, Undertaker was pissed off. He wanted to clear the Spanish announced broadcasting table and get and execute a guild and do his signature power last ride maneuver. However, CM Punk managed to avoid that and do his signature uh, executed a guillotine drop on the ring apron on Punk and his signature move old school but was pulled off the rope. Punk then stole the move and used it against Undertaker. I, like I said, I was there so I don't know what the commentators were saying that night, which is actually a blessing because the commentators nowadays suck. So... Undertaker, like, he's on the ropes with CM Punk, and, yeah, prior to this match, like, you knew Punk was hurt because reports came out that WWE had pulled Punk off of all live shows heading into WrestleMania, house shows heading into WrestleMania, and they said, oh, well, Punk's hurt. And then there was a moment where Punk was injured in the match, apparently. I don't recall the details, but they kept saying that Punk was hurt in the match. Where CM Punk attempted to do his signature diving elbow drop onto the announce onto one of the announce tables and it didn't break. So CM Punk, like I had a feeling like, ooh, like that could be bad. And that would later be broken by Brock Lesnar and Triple H. Since well, we had to break the announce table because that's a guy that's a guaranteed law now. But yeah. Um, CM Punk and Undertaker, they produced a match of the year quality bout. It was awesome, especially when Heyman tried to, um, get back into the ring, get back in the ring and try to strike Undertaker out with the urn. Because, um, Heyman gave CM Punk the urn, which he struck on the back of Undertaker's head. And then, Undertaker, then Punk then mocked Undertaker's traditional pinning style for another two count, and... Then they started to proceed to trade near finishes with the Undertaker's tombstone finally winning out and securing his victory and improving his streak to 21-0. He then reclaimed the urn and walked backstage, pausing on the ramp to raise his fist in victory. Oh my god, this match was awesome. Like, everything about it, the story, the characters, everything about it. Like, this was the first storyline in, in God knows how many years where I felt angry. I felt disgust with CM Punk's antics. Because, I like, I like the talented guy he is, but when the storyline was making you feel angry at the fact that this is what they're doing, but at the same time, I don't think I was mad at Punk. I think I was more, like, mad at WWE. 
because I felt like they should not take these death angles and it just comes off as tasteless and forced. And then so then Ryan Delbert on Bleacher Report talked about this, saying that WWE went too far with it. And then fans once again said the same thing. Yeah, they did this in the Attitude Era. You're just complaining for the sake of complaining. You just wanted... You said, we need more Attitude Era stuff. They gave us Attitude Era stuff. No, we don't want this kind of stuff. That's too far. Um, okay, here's the thing. I said it myself. The Attitude Era was never perfect. Like, even I thought it was taking it too far when they did the death angles. Like, Big Boss Man and the Big Show's fake funeral for Big Show's dad? Yeah, that was tasteless. And while, granted, Big Show's dad was dead years beforehand, they wanted to honor it to an, to an extent. And Big Show had given his blessing, but I would have... If I was on the creative team, I would have protested against this idea because it, because it comes across as tasteless and kind of disturbing a little too much. Like, I'm all for effed up imagery, all for effed up moments. But, like, Death Angles are the one thing that I will never, ever agree with. Like, I'll get if they're trying to honor somebody, but... And that's what they look like they were doing with Undertaker. But at the same time, when they start bringing in CM Punk to do all this stuff with Paul Heyman's urn and then mocking Paul he Paul Bear. Ah, oh, man. I don't know why I keep saying Paul Heyman. Probably because they have the same name to an extent. And I just get mixed up with Paul Bear and Paul Heyman. So, yeah. With the whole storyline, it was so uncomfortable. Like, fans, even though fans know that this was disgusting, dis distasteful and whatnot, they were still cheering for CM Punk. Because it's CM Punk. He's just so good at what he does, is that you can't help but like the guy. And, relatively, this would be Undertaker's final streak match, where he would win, as he would lose in a match a year later, which I'll talk about later on the later down the road. And this would also be CM Punk's final WrestleMania, as he would leave the company a year later due to, dis due to um, issues with the WWE, which I've already talked about in a previous video. So... Yeah, Apollo Heyman would move, would move on to also manage Brock Lesnar later on in the night. And this match really t really much was stole the show because, like, Miz and Wade Barrett during the kickoff, that was point. That was there was no point in that. The Shield versus Randy Orton, Sheamus, and Big Show, that was all right. Mark Henry and Ryback, disaster. Team Elno versus Dolph Ziggler and Big E Langston, okay. Fandango versus Chris Jericho, why? Alberto Del Rio versus Jack Swagger. Well, Jack Swagger was originally supposed to win, which would have been interesting. Triple H and Brock Lesnar, they had to top that. They had to compete after that match. There was no coming back from that. John Cena versus The Rock 2. I'll talk about that in a later video. So, yeah, those were my thoughts on WWE WrestleMania 29, CM Punk versus The Undertaker. This was Neo Reality Entertainment. If you like, comment, subscribe, and donate. Stay tuned for more.